If you grew up in the 80s and 90s, chances are you've at least heard of the Sega Master System, but never actually seen this mythical machine. What is the Sega Master System? Where did it come from? Where did it go? Stay tuned to find out. It's a deep dive. This is Risky Business. In order to make this history easier to digest, I'll be presenting it in a timeline format. Let me know what you think of the timeline in the comments. I hope you'll help the channel grow by liking this video, subscribing, and enabling notifications so you never miss an episode. If you really want to help the channel, there are some affiliate links in the description, and if you buy some stuff with those links, I'll get a few shackles! Now, if you really want to support the channel, I'd be very grateful if you consider joining my Patreon. If you do that, you'll get early access to every episode. I usually have episodes done a week before I upload them to YouTube, but sometimes I can go as early as two weeks before, so it's definitely worthwhile if you're a fan of my content. Now, thank you for listening to that pitch. Without further ado, let's go down the timeline. It all begins in 1934 with the Michigan Bumper Company. Bear with me, I promise this gets more interesting. So this company made and sold metal bumpers for 24 years in and around the Michigan area. Its employees, of course, were totally unaware that it would one day be part of the second most successful video game console manufacturer in the world. Charles Bloodhorn took over the company in 1958. Uh, no, he was not a minotaur. <laughs> Uh, he grew that company into a conglomerate called Gulf and Western. Bloodhorn was a troublemaker as a child, and he moved to, to New York at the age of 16. Bloodhorn greatly diversified Michigan Bumper's business up until 1989, during which time he purchased some very large companies, including Paramount Pictures, Madison Square Garden, and Simon & Schuster, a book publisher. Meanwhile, David Rosen, a former airman living in Japan started Rosen Industries, a company that exported Japanese art to the U.S. and sold photos for Japanese IDs. They began producing arcade games in 1957. At the same time, Martin Bromley and Richard Stewart, two American sailors living in Japan, started a company called Nihon Goraku Busan, the Japanese Amusement Products Company. They operated in both the United States and Japan. I suppose it was only a matter of time before these industrious expats with a mutual interest in the emerging field of video games found each other. Nihon Goraku Busan merged with Rosen in 1960, at which time Rosen became the CEO and president. While the newly formed Sega was just getting started, a medical student named Hayao Nakayama dropped out of med school and began working for a company called at least Jukeboxes. Not content to serve a niche business, Nakayama pitched an idea to begin leasing arcade machines. Nakayama saw money in the popular new industry, but his bosses felt that it was too big a risk. Nakayama left shortly thereafter and started his own company called ESCO, which leased arcade machines. In 1969, Sega was sold to Gulf and Western, becoming part of the large and successful conglomerate. In 1979, they purchased ESCO, and Nakayama would work closely with Rosen in the coming years. They continued to release arcade games up until 1982, when the arcade manufacturing part of the business was sold to Bally, one of the largest producers of arcade hardware in the world. You might remember some 90s arcade machines with uh, Bally Midway logos on them, and of course, prior to that, just Bally logos, but I, that's what I remember from when I was growing up. This left two separate companies, Sega R&D, Research and Development in the United States, and Sega Enterprises in Japan. During this time, Sega developed the SC3000, a home computer with a keyboard. It did not sell very well. Bloodhorn died in 1984, and Gulf and Western began selling some of its subsidiaries. Rosen and Nakayama purchased Sega with the help of some outside investors, led by Iso Okawa, 
a Japanese businessman who owned CSK Holdings Corporation. Nakayama took Rosen's place as CEO, and Rosen moved back to the U.S. to continue working for the American branch of the company. This would eventually lead to the company's downfall many years later, but that's going to be a story for another time. It was around this time that Nakayama learned of Nintendo's plans to release a game console, and he decided to throw his hat into the ring. He released the first Sega console, the Master System's predecessor, the SG-1000. This was a very primitive system, and it wasn't as popular as Nintendo's system. Moreover, Nintendo had begun the practice of licensing third parties in deals that required exclusivity. This meant that the Famicom slash NES was able to grow a large and diverse library of games, while Sega had to rely mostly on their original titles. The price point was about the same at 15,000 yen, as opposed to the 14,800 yen price point of the NES, about $160 in today's money. Leave a comment if you would like to see deep dives about the SC-3000 and SG-1000. A second edition of the SG-1000 called the Mark II was released later, which featured detachable controllers. That was a feature the Famicom did not have. Unfortunately, this unit didn't sell well either, so Nakayama set out to release an upgraded console that would be able to compete with Nintendo's juggernaut. The Master System was then released in Japan as the SG-1000 Mark III in October of 1985, at the same price point of 15,000 yen. This is particularly impressive, you're going to find out a little bit more later about why that's very impressive that they were able to keep that same price point. The launch was followed with a release in the US in September of 1986 as the Master System, with a price point of $200, which is about $450 in today's money. Big money. <laughs> it included a multi-cart, which contained Hang-On and Safari Hunt. It was then released in Europe in 1987, and finally in Brazil in 1989, which seems really late since the Mega Drive Genesis was right around the corner, but we'll talk a little bit more about that later. A Japanese re-release in 1987 included an FM synthesis chip and rapid fire feature that was rebranded to the Master System. So they started calling it the Master System in Japan as well. A note on the Europe release, you'll note if you saw my NES video that this release is prior to the NES's release in Europe. So by the time the NES came out there, the Master System had already been released to the market. Now, don't worry about old Gulf and Western. You might know them today as Paramount. They're doing okay. <laughs> Sega's biggest challenge in competing with Nintendo was licensing. Nintendo's exclusive licensing of third-party titles meant that there were slim pickings for Sega, who developed and published many of their own titles. While the Master System had better hardware than the NES, it simply didn't have an impressive enough library. Made up of mostly arcade ports and first-party titles, only 360 games were ever released for the platform, against 720 games for the Famicom. Furthermore, the Famicom library had a much larger ratio of quality games than Sega's library. In Japan, the Master System only sold about 1 million units against the Famicom's 2.5 million units. Here in the US, the Nintendo Entertainment System sold 34 million units, but the Master System fizzled out with only 2 million units sold. That is a very, very small piece of the market share here in the U.S. The numbers get a bit more interesting when we look at Europe and South America, which wind up being key markets for the Master System. Out of approximately 13 million units sold worldwide, a little less than half were sold in Europe. Nintendo didn't really market the NES very well in the rest of the world, and their sales figures reflected that. Fewer than 7 million units sold in all of Europe and Latin America. Meanwhile, the Sega Master System sold 6.8 million units in Europe alone. The market in Europe was dominated by home computers at the time, so to be the best-selling game console in that region is very impressive. The most interesting and bizarre fact about the Master System, however, is that in spite of its late release, the Master System remains today the best-selling video game system in Brazil. Even the Mega Drive did not sell it. The Master System and its various iterations sold over 8 million units in the no-holds-barred fighting capital of the world. This was mostly due to the fact that Brazil was a developing nation, and even well-off households didn't have the money to spend on expensive electronics. 
An affordable game console released just at the end of the 8-bit era was a surprisingly smart business move, as was licensing both the development of consoles and the development and publishing of games to a third party. Tech Toy, a large Brazilian toy company, continued making and selling games for the Master System up until 2015, with their last Master System console released in 2007, and uh, that came with a six-button controller. For Brazilians, the relatively small jump in quality that came with moving to the Mega Drive simply wasn't worth the money when their Master System was already a luxury item. Much of the Brazilian library consisted of Master System ports of Genesis titles, and even included a Master System version of Street Fighter 2 that looks way better than it should, all things considered. It's time to put on your shiny thing, because we're diving in! While most of us think of the mid to late 80s as the 8-bit era, the truth is that the Master System was, in reality, a hybrid 8-16-bit system. While the processor itself was 8-bit, the graphics chip had a 16-bit data bus. This is why the graphics on the Master System are leaps and bounds ahead of what could be offered on the NES. The Master System's CPU was a Zilog Z80, the same chip used as a coprocessor in the Neo Geo. This chip was more than twice as fast as the NES at 4 MHz. The Master System also completely blew the NES out of the water in terms of memory, with 8 kilobytes of system RAM and 16 kilobytes of video RAM four and eight times as much as the NES, respectively. The NES did compensate for that weakness by allowing the PPU to access system RAM directly, so it could render sprites on screen much faster, but because the Master System does not have this technology, it's not out of the ordinary for the games to feel much slower than similar games on the competitor platform. I definitely noticed while I was getting the game footage for this video that some of the games do feel very, very slow. The graphics chip was a Yamaha YM2602B VDP. It could display up to 32 colors. It could also display 16 colors per sprite against the 4 colors per sprite of the NES, which is why these games look a lot more colorful. Due to all this power, the Master System had the unique ability to flip background tiles, meaning backgrounds could be animated. The NES could not do this, but it could, however, flip sprites which is why you'll notice a uh, big difference in terms of the uh, the animation of the sprites. This is a little bit of a ding in the armor for the Master System. They really don't have anywhere near as much animation in the sprites, so things don't look quite as lively. A point back in the favor of the Master System is that it could support scrolling, whereas the NES could only display static backgrounds. So you may remember the 80s ability to scroll backward, uh, scroll backgrounds rather from my Neo Geo video. Uh, this definitely loaned itself really well on the Master System to like games like Gradius, you know, shooting games like that. Whereas games that had a lot more action going on on screen, a lot more movement of the sprites, really felt very slow and didn't look as good. The Master System used similar 8-bit audio. The Sega audio chip had two square wave channels, one noise channel, and a sample channel. The Japanese Master System also had an FM synthesis chip, but this was never released outside of Japan. Because the Master System had an additional square wave channel instead of a triangle wave channel, you may notice that the music sounds a little tinnier than the NES. That's because it lacks the low frequencies of a triangle wave channel. The NES definitely had better audio. If you would like to learn more about how 8-bit audio works, you can get more detail in my NES Deep Dive video. It's just gonna be there. It's gonna be there. The Master System also had a BIOS screen and a built-in snail maze game that would boot up if you turned the console on without a game in it. While the Western and Japanese consoles share the same design, the Japanese cartridges are slightly smaller, and instead of trying to make the machine look like a VCR, Sega kept their video game console looking like a video game console, with a top loader for the cartridge. The console could also use Sega cards, games stored in the card, instead of a cartridge, but only 15 card titles were ever released. Master System cartridges could hold up to 500 kilobytes of data, though most games did not come anywhere near this limit. The cards held only 32 kilobytes. Some of the most popular games released on these Sega cards include Hang On, My Hero, and Spy vs. Spy. Later on, re later on, rewritable cards could be purchased, similar to the rewritable FDS discs Nintendo offered in Japan. 
the price to purchase a card was 5,000 yen, and rewrites were 1,800 yen. So it's about like 5 bucks to buy a card, and 2 bucks to refill it, it's actually pretty good. A model called the Master System 2 was later released for Western markets without the Sega card, expansion port, or reset button. These consoles included Alex Kid Miracle World or Sonic the Hedgehog as a built-in game. A number, a number of accessories were available for the Master System, including a light gun, 3D glasses, and all kinds of different joysticks. There was even a controller that looked like the handlebars on a bicycle. The standard controller had an 8-way D-pad and two buttons, a, uh, an A and B button or a 1 and 2 button. Uh, there was no start button on the controller and the pause button is on the console itself. 360 total games were released for the Master System. The most notable games were arcade ports like Fantasy Zone, Sp Space Harrier, and OutRun. Before Sonic came around, Alex Kidd was the unofficial mascot for the Master System, and standout titles are the excellent RPG Fantasy Star and some very competent Sonic the Hedgehog ports. In the U.S., it was unusual to see Master Systems out in the wild. We all had the NES. However, one kid in my neighborhood had a Master System, and I remember playing it at his house a few times. I was particularly impressed by Ghostbusters and Double Dragon, way better looking versions than those found available for the NES. After that, I asked my parents for a Master System, but you couldn't hardly find them anywhere, so we remained a Nintendo household. I wasn't as excited about making this video as I was about my NES video, and the reason for that is simply because I didn't have one growing up, and my experience with one was pretty minimal. I only played a few times at my friend's house, so it's not as emotionally interesting for me as the NES. You're going to find as I move forward with these, when I get to the Super Nintendo and the PlayStation, that's when I'm really going to have a lot more to say. Now that kind of leads into the whole rub of the story though. If the Master System was so much more powerful than the NES, then why did it perform so poorly? And it really just comes down to Nintendo's tactics. Nintendo was downright cutthroat in their business practices, refusing to allow stores to stock their product if a competitor product was sold, and requiring ex exclusive licenses for third-party developers. Nobody else really had a chance in the US, they had a stranglehold on the market. And it's a shame, because could you imagine some of your favorite third-party NES games with the 16-bit graphics back in 1987? The video game landscape may have been very different. Nintendo's tactics would eventually come back to bite them later, but that's also a story for another time. That's the end of my script. I don't really have much else to say about the Master System. It had really nice graphics, but there's just not that many great games for it. So while I would love to say that it's a fantastic system and worthwhile to go and find one these days, I'm not so sure that it really is. I think that it's something that it, you can probably live without. But that doesn't mean that it wasn't remarkable and interesting in its own right for being a hybrid 816-bit console during the 8-bit era, and for having that amazing life in Brazil, of all places, where it was the main video game console for decades, and I think probably still is today. Well, I hope you really enjoyed this deep dive. Once again, please support the channel, subscribe, like, enable notifications, and if you would be so kind as to use one of my affiliate links or join my Patreon, I'd be very grateful. Thank you very much, and until next time, game over.